right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I think we can start. But first, could you please type yes in the chat box if you can hear me and see me OK? Please type yes, locate the chat box, because you will need it a bit later for questions and answers. Fantastic. Thank you. Some audience participation right from the outset. Nothing worse than coming on to a webinar on mute. Believe you me, it's happened to me before. So good afternoon. I'm your moderator this afternoon. My name's Pandora Mather Lees and I am an Art World consultant. I own art on superyachts.com, which is a consultancy and training business for captains, crew and the super yacht industry in managing and handling the risk really with the billions of pounds worth of art on super yachts floating around in international waters, which is an area of compliance itself. But it's my pleasure to welcome you to this webinar entitled Practical AML Solutions for Auctioneers. And of course, as you've already guessed, no doubt, we are talking about the fifth anti-money laundering directive or AML D5 or 5 AML or whatever you want to call it. So this afternoon, we are going to have an hour long webinar to enable you to get guidance, to have clarity and to get up to speed on what you need to do before the second deadline, which is in the final deadline, which is the 10th of June of this year. And this of course is bearing in mind that this regulation came to pass in January last year. And I think since its inception, it has been problematic. I think the problem is certainly for um, our panelists have realized this. And when I was in art fairs just before the lockdown back in January, people were saying to me, Pandora, you know, this regulation is ridiculous. It's too admin intensive. The thresholds are too low. How on earth, how on earth am I going to really comply as a lot of bureaucratic box ticking and so it's been very very difficult for them and people even told me they weren't going to do anything about it which is a little bit dangerous because this is um, a law with criminal penalties. So whilst some people have find it tricky I think other people have always been engaging perhaps in best practice perhaps some of the bigger organizations and they're already probably doing much of what they need to do to be compliant with this regulation uh, because they've had very high standards. But nevertheless, if that's you, uh, stick around because it's always a good idea to sharpen up your best practice and to um, be just doubly sure you know what you're doing. So for the others, uh, the good news is that you are going to have this afternoon really practical solutions, the nuts and bolts of what to do with the uh, directive and how you should move forward and what processes you should engage with. In fact, you're gonna have a 360 degree coverage of everything that's required from our expert panelists this afternoon. So I'm really looking forward to this debate and I am now going to introduce our panelists who will just say who they are and what they do. And then we're going to launch into four presentations and then we will have a Q&A at the end, which I hope you will use and pose lots of questions. So let's start with our first panelist, Sarah Buchanan of Snoofer. What a fantastic name. Sarah, please tell us what Snoofer does. Thank you, Pandora, and a warm welcome to you all. So hello, I'm Sarah, MD of Snoofer, which is art market software provider and I'm also director of Amati which is a specialist stringed instrument auctioneers. Thank you. Thank you very much Sarah and now I'd like to turn to Caroline Watson who is a data privacy consultant. Caroline and I in fact have worked together for many years in the art market and she is an expert on many things technical and specifically to do with auction houses but today she's going to talk to us about her other expertise, which is data privacy. Caroline is director of iComply. Caroline, would you like to say a couple of words? Mute. Come off of mute. It would help if you came off of mute. <laughs> as, as a certified information privacy professional, I provide pragmatic business solutions for my clients uh, to enable them to achieve full compliance with privacy regulations. My wide reaching auction experience spans the fine art and commercial auctioneering sectors. And I've worked internationally with Europe, the USA and the Middle East, balancing the statutory and regulatory requirements of high value asset dealers uh, with data protection legislation. 
Thank you, Caroline. That's very comprehensive. And now I would like to turn to Jerry. Jerry Walters, who I gather is coming to us from Wales. I hope the weather's good down there, Jerry. Could you tell us a little yeah. bit about what you do? Yes, yeah, surprisingly, the sun is shining in uh, Wales, and I won't mention the rugby, I promise you. Um, my hi, I'm Jerry Walters. So after spending the best part of half a lifetime, 30 years in law enforcement, predominantly um, within Thames Valley Police and the City London Police, and the vast majority of that was within the financial crime arena. So the investigation of serious and complex fraud and quite crucially money laundering. And a lot of those cases involved works of art. They featured quite prominently. Uh, and then in 2017, I established the company FCS Compliance Limited. Uh, I'm pleased to say we've gone from strength to strength. We are now a team of six of us, all drawn from a law enforcement background. Uh, and we're the only UK company, I guess, that do absolutely everything in terms of AML under one roof, from uh, compliance documentation to drafting risk assessments, policy procedures, customer details, training, liaison with HMRC and suspicious activity reporting. So uh, that's me and that's FCS Compliance. Thank you, Jerry. Gosh, that's really comprehensive. So we're, we're looking forward to hearing all these presentations. And now I would like to turn to our fourth panelist, Tom Christofferson, who is a very well known and respected art world lawyer. Tom is a consultant lecturer at Sotheby's Institute of Art and is ex Sotheby's himself. And he is a fellow liveryman with me in the Worshipful Company of Art Scholars, and in fact, our past master. So Tom, I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself, and then if you could launch into the first presentation and your introduction so that we can make a smooth segue into the webinar. Thank you. Right, <clears throat> thanks Pandora. Um, yes, so I, I was European General Counsel for uh, about well, nearly 20 years at Sotheby's and since then have provided art law consultancy services to Constantine Cannon and Bonhams and various others. Um, so uh, that's that's me, that's my experience. Um, and let's go on and talk about these uh, regulations. Uh, Jerry, do you have, do you, brilliant, thank you. So that that's the, the full title of the regulations that we have to deal with. Um, and, and that's the problem. We have to deal with them. You can't avoid it. There's no choice. And as Pandora said, they have been in force since last January, January 2020. Obviously, last year was a bit strange with an awful lot of people not going anywhere near their, their business premises. But uh, nevertheless, these things were in force then. And the, the next big deadline is the 10th of June. And again, as Pandora said, that's when you have to have registered with HMRC if you are a qualifying art market practitioner. Uh, and we'll look at what that means in a minute. And the next thing is, if you are one of those, then the place to go for as a sort of reference uh, material, um, which is free and available to everybody, is the British Art Market Federation, BAMF, most, most of you will know, uh, guidance on the regulations. Um, it's quite a big document, it's, it's about 100 pages long, so it's, it's not a, a three page quick skip, but it is, I think, very useful. Um, it, 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 if you like, tries to translate these financial regulations uh, into an art world, art market uh, practical guide. Um, so it is long, it is detailed, but hopefully it is helpful and it will be reviewed from time to time as we develop more experience of these regulations in the art market. And I put on the slide there uh, where you can find the guidance. I think you can also find it through the SNUFA website. That guidance falls into seven uh, sections. Part two of the guidance falls into seven sections, uh, which I've listed there in red. And they are the key areas that you have to address as part of these regulations. Um, most people know all about the customer due diligence requirement sitting there at number five. Um, but you must remember that you have these other steps. They are all mandatory. And HMRC, as our supervising authority, will expect to be able to see documentary evidence that you have done and are doing these seven steps. So uh, and that's something that you'll need to have in place already and if you haven't got it in place already you need to get it in place pretty quickly and we'll look at them very briefly uh, in a minute and then uh, Jerry's going to follow up on some of those in a little bit more 
detail, but that that's what you need to know. Um, next slide, please, Jerry. Right, the first question, you know, are you caught or not? Who is regulated? Well, it's auctioneers and dealers, anyone involved in the sale of works of art where the sale price is 10,000 euros or above in a single or series of linked transactions. We can look at that a little bit. The first point is what is a work of art? Because it's actually quite a narrow definition. It comes from the old VAT Act. So it's the same definition that many of you will be familiar with uh, in terms of your VAT obligations. So it's basically paintings, sculpture, um, limited editions of tapestries, sculptures, uh, ceramics, or handmade tapestries to be exact, um, enamels on copper, and limited edition photographs. That is a summary. There's a, um, a, a, a copy of the full list in the Banff guidance. So what that means is, perhaps surprisingly, that furniture, antiques, unless they come in the list above, um, jewellery, collectibles, cars, stamps, coins, do not currently fall within the regulations, um, which has two consequences, really. The first thing is, um, in theory, at least, you are not required to carry out these AML um, obligations if you're dealing in those items, which gives you a difficult choice if you're dealing in some regulated items and some not. You have to think about how you handle that. Uh, but the second point to remember is that does not mean you don't have any obligations at all for the things that are not in that list, such as furniture, because there are existing other existing laws particularly the Proceeds of Crime Act from 2002, and also the various sanctions uh, legislation that cover all objects. So it doesn't mean you're completely out of the frame, it just means that the AML regulations themselves only apply to the items with the little red arrows. So assuming you're selling those, and assuming you're selling them at more than 10,000 euros, uh, bearing in mind that that 10,000 euros threshold is the total price of commissions and other costs attached to the transaction. That means, so if you're an auctioneer, for instance, it would include buyer's premium. So it would mean that the hammer price threshold is actually, depending on your rates of buyer's premium, probably around about eight and a half or 9,000, not 10. So be careful about that. Um, and the third thing to remember is, unlike before, they don't take any notice of how you are being paid. So previously, if you were being paid cash above uh, the threshold, then you, you'd be caught by the high value uh, regulations. Whereas now it doesn't matter what the uh, method of payment is. Um, if you are carrying out these transactions, you are caught within the uh, parameters, you're caught by the regulations, however you are paid. Uh, right, Jerry, should we move on? Thank you. So th there's the list of things that the uh, Banff guidance covers and they're the main areas of the regulations. Um, and we're going to look at some of these in more detail in a minute, but from a practical point of view, from a user's point of view, if you like, i make a few comments on them. The first is on the risk assessment. Uh, this is a mandatory requirement. You have to do it, which means you've got to do it in a formal way. You've got to have records to show that you've done it. Uh, but I'd also point out it's actually an incredibly useful thing to do, uh, I think, in practice for two reasons. One is uh, you can effectively, to an extent, set your own exam questions. The, the money laundering regulations are all about risk assessment. They're all about the risk assessment of your business. Uh, um, so it isn't the same for everybody. The risks for Sotheby's or Bonhams will not be the same as for a regional auction house or um, you know, a Petworth dealer, um, the risks will be very different. And this is your opportunity to make that clear that for your business, and nobody knows your business better than you, uh, the relevant risks are A, B, C, and maybe D and E are not such a practical risk for your business. And that is going to have an effect on number two, your AML policy. You have to have one again, it has to be uh, written and uh, it, you have to be be able to show that you've got it. It has to address all the relevant issues and risks. So therefore it feeds from your own risk assessment. Uh, number three, the client due diligence. I'm going to park for a moment because I know Jerry's going to talk about that in more depth in a minute. Uh, number four, you need to appoint an anti-money laundering reporting officer. Um, 
if, if you've only got two people in your business, well, then it'll be one of you, but you have to have one. Um, they, ha they cannot be a junior person. You cannot appoint the intern and just say, run away and do all this. It needs to be a senior person in the business. And they have higher levels of personal responsibility for both your policy, your training and your processes. Um, so they need to be very well trained. Frankly, they need to know their way around that Banff guidance document pretty well because they have responsibilities on behalf of the company and then your company through them has those responsibilities. They would also be the person responsible for suspicious activity reports, these SARs that you have to make where you have a suspicious transaction. And that's a whole um, training area in itself. So we're not going to spend too much time on suspicious activity reports. That's for another day. But they will be, they will be run through your anti-laundering money laundering reporting officer. And then number five, regular staff AML training. Again, mandatory, and you must have records, and that means quite detailed records of who you've trained, when you've trained them, and, and how you train them. Uh, and that's another issue which AML, um, which uh, HMRC may well ask to see uh, at some point. Um, and I've referred to section four of the guidance there, there's quite a lot of information on how you might do that training, who should receive the training. Um, I think at some level or other, all your staff should receive it, but you may provide slightly more detailed training for certain members of staff, particularly those involved in the financial sectors or client facing staff. And then the last one, um, this is a bureaucracy folks, um, sorry about this, but you must keep records of all that you're doing in, in this area, because now that we are a regulated industry, it means there is a supervisory authority, HMRC, who have the right to come and knock on your door and say, I want to see your papers, your records on how you're um, implementing uh, the AML regulations. So they'll want to see your risk assessment, they'll want to see your policy, they'll want to see your training, they'll want to speak to your officer, and then they'll want to look at um, you know, what you're doing in terms of client due diligence in practice. You know, have you had some difficult uh, decisions to make on whether you think something is suspicious or not? And when you've made them, I mean, you, you've made your own risk assessment on a case by case basis. Make sure you've got some record of that risk assessment in that case and your thinking and your decision and why you made the decision you did. Um, because frankly, it's quite relatively easy for HMRC to trip you up if you haven't even got the records to show that you are trying to do this properly. Um, so that's really, I think all I wanted to say is that these are the areas you need to cover and you need to cover them very soon if you haven't done them already because the first way of tripping up on all of this is going past the June deadline, not registering when you should have done. And it's frankly very easy for HMRC to go onto Google and see if you're selling something that is the right type of work of art for more than 10,000 euros. And if you are and you haven't registered, problem number one. Problem number two is you'll need to show that you carried out all these steps. Uh, next slide, please, Jerry. So we're going to look at some of the more detail in the steps. This is a practical process and, and obviously we can ask questions later. And I think Jerry's also going to give you quite a lot of information of what might happen to you if you don't follow the steps. So I've waved the carrot, Jeremy's, co Jerry's coming with the stick. Over to you, Jerry. Thank you, Tom. The days of the good, good cop, bad cop have come, just come back, turning back to me. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Just some, a bit of a detail, a bit of background, obviously just to reinforce the fact of what Tom's just said, this is um, secondary criminal legislation. So what you're going to be asked to comply with is not just guidance from HMRC, it is actually criminal legislation. Hence the fact, um, as well as having fines attached to this piece of legislation, it does, I'm afraid, carry a term of imprisonment of up to two years. So it is something you really need to be uh, compliant with going forward. So just going on from what Tom was saying, um, one of the, one of the uh, services that EFSA's compliance uh, provides is we sit in on HMRC supervisory visits, not on behalf of HMRC, I should add, uh, but because our client has asked us to. And uh, I can assure you, certainly the latter part of 2019, uh, pre-COVID times, 
we sat in on a number of HMRC inspections, particularly around the property sector, when they were carrying out uh, supervisory visits to see that uh, state agents of property professionals were com fully compliant with the money laundering regulations, exactly the same regulations uh, that you are now being asked to comply with. So the four key areas that they will home in, and I can absolutely guarantee it for you, uh, this is the first one. They will want to see that you have comprehensive, and I underline the word comprehensive, anti-money laundering policies, controls and procedures. Now, I sat in on a webinar uh, last week uh, to do with the art sector where one of the advice and guidance was, well, it will vary from firm to firm, but it might just be a couple of paragraphs. I can assure you it has to be more than a couple of paragraphs. Uh, it has to be a very thorough document. What the document is attempting to do, or what you are attempting to do or to set out, um, is based looking at your business, looking at everything to do with your business, and it is effectively uh, your manual, your Bible you go to that will say exactly the areas that you need to cover and how you carry out those uh, purposes or your procedures to actually comply with the legislation. So, for instance, it, it must set out things like what is money laundering? Um, you must set it quite clearly what it is that, you know, you may well have people working in your organization have no idea what money laundering is. They've heard the, the, the phraseology, the terminology, but you actually need to set out quite clearly what it is. The legislation, what is the legislation that you operate under? Well, effectively, you, under, uh, you operate under two main bits, which is the Proceed Crime Act 2002 and the Money Laundering Regulations 2017. So you must set out, and there's a huge or a significant difference between those two bits of legislation, and you must set out quite clearly what they are and the main offences within the legislation. The roles and responsibilities of the MLRO uh, must set out who it is, first of all, and ideally a deputy MLRO, and whether you've got, you're large enough to have a Money Laundering Compliance Officer as well. And what are the responsibilities for your staff, the recognition of the red flags that are pertinent to your particular business that you must uh, point uh, staff in the right direction on? How you keep records, well, that will arrive well, whether you keep them electronically in paper format or both, whatever it is, and of course, how long you keep them with in line with the money laundering regulations. The aspect of training, I look at both of those just briefly in a second. Customer due diligence, it'll be looking at how you actually do it, when and how, et cetera, you actually undertake CDD and whether you use things like uh, the assistance of an online verification company. Training, how often it's delivered, uh, when it should be delivered. And again, I'll feature on, I'll give you a bit of background on that in a, in a couple of minutes. And then how you deal with uh, what are, uh, excuse the pun, top of the political agenda, politically exposed persons. Under the money laundering regulations, you have to have something in place which will allow you to identify whether somebody is or they aren't a politically exposed person. So you need to feature that in the handout. You should also refer to financial sanctions and what you're going to deal with somebody or how you will deal with somebody. Uh, God forbid you have a positive hit on somebody who is subject to financial sanctions or an asset freeze and what you must do in relation to them. And finally, which might be optional, depending on the size and nature of your business and taking a proportional view, you may, may even have an anti-bribery and corruption policy, an ABC policy uh, at the back of the document. So that will give you an idea. It, it, it kind of has to be more than a couple of paragraphs, I can assure you. Uh, and it is something obviously we do on a day in, day out for uh, people who are subject to the money laundering regulations. So please, uh, it must be a comprehensive document. It's not something you can put together on a couple of sides of A4. So the second document that goes sort of hand in glove with that is an anti-money laundering firm-wide risk assessment, as Tom referred to, which is in line with Regulation 18. Now, the two documents must mirror each other. You must say, for instance, in your risk assessment that you have, for instance, an anti-money laundering policy and procedure and what it, uh, what it entails. So the two documents sort of go uh, hand in glove together. The five areas that you have to cover in the risk assessment, doesn't matter what size of business you are, you must cover these five areas. And within each area, then you're going to have various subsections. So again, in terms of detail, it has to be a comprehensive document, but it, it has to be bespoke to your particular business. It's no good, again, going onto the internet and downloading something off, uh, you know, because you have to find Sotheby's risk assessment and, you know, and you're a small firm of auction, you know, local auctioneers with maybe three or four members of staff, it has to be pertinent to your own particular business. Now, when it looks at the five key areas here, uh, just give you some very basic examples and how they're kind of linked and how they fit in with each other. Your customers generally will cover things like um, 
whether you have a lot of local people, uh, tr traditionally uh, local to your business, that come and bid at an auction or whatever it might be, or whether you have a lot of people from overseas, you have a lot of overseas clients, um, whether you form a business relationship with uh, what we'd describe as a complex opaque company structures, so legal structures like companies or offshore trusts, and again, whether you have things like politically exposed persons as customers or clients. If you've got people from overseas, what are the sort of countries or geog geographic areas they tend to uh, emanate from or do they reside in? And are those countries particularly high risk as, as deemed by the legislation? And the products or services, yes, that will again look at things like the value of the items that you're selling, anything that fits, fits within the, uh, the, the uh, remit of a works of art. Are you selling works of art at the five million pounds or at the uh, 20,000? Again, that might influence the, uh, the level of risk that that's your business is, is exposed to. And the transactions, well, again, if you are, again, forming a business relationship with people from overseas, the general rule, uh, there's a strong possibility, shall we say, that you are going to have money that's been remitted from uh, an overseas financial institution. And again, is that uh, located in the country that is potentially higher risk? And then the final aspect will be the delivery channels, which will include things like um, what percentage of your uh, sales did you do purely online with a lack of face to face contact with uh, your buyers or your bidders. Again, that will potentially pose a higher risk. Now, the other thing that's that's not on the list or the other areas that are not on the list, but really have to be in a, a AML risk assessment are things like um, training, which we'll come on to in a second, the level of training, who has been trained, who hasn't been trained, etc. Uh, the appointment of an MRO. So again, that fits in with your policy and procedure document. Whether you're registered with the National Crime Agency for the filing of suspicious activity reports and how many reports you filed in the last 12 months. Now, in, in terms of the risk assessment, once you've drafted this document, you should be uh, revisiting it then every 12 months to, to check whether there have been any sort of changes. I don't suspect there'll be major changes to it, but nevertheless, some of the percentages might have changed in terms of the volume of clients that you're getting from overseas or, or, or online sales because of COVID, for instance, as an example. So you probably need to be re revisiting that document every 12 months just to update it and make sure it is in line with how your current business model is operating. So that's, a, that's two parts of four then, shall we say, that you've got to have in place, no ifs and buts about them. And you have to provide these documents to, to HMRC on demand, either when they do a desktop visit, as they call it, or when they say, uh, they send you an email and say, unfortunately, we are coming to visit you on such and such a date, you will have to provide these documents in advance of any supervisory visit. So the third area will be training. Now, the regulations, the money laundering regulations themselves don't set out how often it has to be. Uh, however, I can tell you that HMRC guidance in terms of the property sector is recommending that you should have training every two years. Now, that doesn't mean to say that you have to have four hours of content every two years, but certainly it was recommended that you should have some good solid foundation training uh, and then that be refreshed or topped up by webinars or whatever it might be or refresher courses. In terms of who should be trained, well the best way to describe it is all frontline staff. So frontline staff would include your, uh, your sales negotiators, people who are directly involved with the sales of works of art and also people who may be in the back office that have a uh, influence or involved with the financial aspect of the business. They again should receive some sort of training. The one thing I'd say to you quite crucially about the training though, please make it relevant and make it bespoke to your particular sector. It's no good sending people on a, a general anti-money laundering course. You need to be talking about your sector specifically. Yes, some of the things will be generic as you go through the legislation as an example, but nevertheless, make sure that it is relevant to your particular section and bespoke to your particular line of business, i.e. the art world or auctioneers. And keep a written, rocket, written record. This is one of the, uh, the third document that you will have to provide to HMRC, uh, either pre an actual visit or during the course of it. So it's essential you keep a written record of who had training, when and how often, etc. And what, quite crucially, so what did the training actually consist of? And then the fourth final area, which is the tick in the box, and shall we say, is customer due diligence. Uh, and your anti-money laundering policy and procedure document should set quite clearly why 
when and how you actually undertake CDD. Now, in terms of uh, due diligence, these are the three, uh, the only three levels that, that, uh, that you should have in any anti-money running policy procedure, which is simplified, standard and enhanced. And what you need to quite clearly set out in your compliance document or your policy procedure document is when it's appropriate to do all three, actually setting out what, it, what, what all three are and the difference between them and actually when it's appropriate to actually undertake these different levels of CDD, okay? It's absolutely essential. We see time and time again, some rather bizarre names for these, some of these initials like extended due diligence. There is no such thing. These are the regulations and these are the three terms or types of uh, due diligence that you would undertake going forward. And it's a great understanding. This is the crucial uh, understanding from the fourth aspect of your business because during the course of any HMRC visit, uh, online or face-to-face -face or whatever it might be, uh, the three areas of the documents they'll ask for. And the fourth one then that goes with that is actually uh, asking to see particular client files where they will then actually go through the level of or the files themselves individually, looking to see whether you've complied with the money laundering regulations. And quite crucially, you are doing what you say you're doing in your policy and procedure document. That's why it's important that you have more than a couple of pages of A4 because uh, this should take up about seven pages in itself. So that's the uh, what you have to have. Those are the four actual critical areas that you're going to have to do to comply with HMRC to keep the wolf from the door. Uh, and if you don't, unfortunately, and I'll show you a couple of fines that have been handed down recently. These are the key areas. These are the breaches that they can uh, they can potentially set out. As you can see here, the risk assessment policy procedures quite feature quite strongly at the top of the list, uh, and the customer diligence is the fourth aspect. So going forward, just to remind you again what Thomas said, you have to register by the 10th of June 2021. Also, crucially, after that date, once you've registered, if there are any significant changes to your business, like a change of a money laundering reporting officer, or whatever it might be, you must inform HMRC of those changes. Uh, we had a, a property professional um, only a couple of weeks ago contacted us, unfortunately, had forgotten to register for the last, uh, let's just say, the few years diplomatically, and they've just landed a, a significant fine just by failing to register their business. So it's something you please must not forget by the 10th of June 2021. Now, I said to you, uh, HMRC have been active during COVID. Um, these are the latest fines they've handed down. There are no art dealers on there yet, you'd be pleased to know. Please don't make sure as an auction house or an art dealer, you're not the first to appear on this list. Uh, but generally you can see here, this is the level of fine you can expect. And these are breaches predominantly, uh, 19 is the policy and procedure document. All these are breaches of, of customer due diligence. Uh, the top one, as you can see here, was a money bureau, 23 million pounds. You're pleased to know uh, that was the largest fine HMC HMRC has ever handed down. Um, so that was the money bureau, but these are recent fines. Now, quite crucially, yes, the fine as you can see are 5,000, 6,000 pounds. Well, it's not a huge amount, but it is, I would suggest to your business, money down the drain. But more importantly, what goes with that is the fact that you appear on this document on the government website forever and a day. And it's the reputational damage that you really want to be trying to avoid because then your trade press will see you are the first person to now be a find. Uh, and I would suggest to you in, in putting myself in your position, it's the reputational damage that will be worrying more than the actual fine potentially that can be handed down. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Jerry, and thank you, Tom. And I think there's some really important takeaways from that, you know, seven sections, we should be referring to BAMF and really the, the owner it's very onerous on people, but it is important that uh, we conduct formal protocol that is thorough, personalised and is reviewed regularly. So I think we have all been warned and thank you for that very um, good overview. I'd like to turn now to you, Caroline, and you're going to talk to us about how this dovetails with uh, GDPR, I understand. Yes, fantastic. So you've complied with AML, don't breach GDPR. Uh, remember GDPR? It's been a little while now. A lot's changed since 2018. The UK has left the EU. We haven't left our houses much. Incidentally, although the UK has left the EU and EU re regulation no longer applies, as the GDPR has been incorporated into UK law, the core data protection principles, rights and obligations do still stand. So if you thought you did GDPR back in 2018, but you've not done very much since, 
you're overdue a refresh. AML now requires auctioneers to collect and process more personal data than ever before. Some of you will be handling ID documents for the very first time, some of you just in much greater volumes. This obligation increases the information security risk for your business. So while implementing your new AML procedures, ensure that you don't lose sight of the core GDPR principles. Next slide, please. <laughs> so the core GDPR principles are lawfulness, fairness, and transparency, purpose limitation, data minimization, accuracy, storage limitation, integrity and confidentiality comprising security and accountability. Now, I'm not gonna go through all of these points because I simply don't have the time, but I just want to pull out a couple of key considerations for you. You must have lawful grounds to process personal data. And you may find that more than one lawful basis applies at different stages of the process. So contractual necessity, legitimate interest and legal obligation could all come into play when dealing with your bid of registration and your AML compliance. As a data controller, you'll need to identify the relevant lawful basis for the processing you're undertaking and record this in your record of processing. You need to be clear, open and honest with people from the very start about how you're going to use their personal data. Have you informed your bidders? Are the AML changes reflected in your terms and conditions and your privacy notices? In terms of security, integrity and confidentiality are key. You're required to process personal data securely using appropriate technological and organizational measures. Are your staff aware of their responsibilities for protecting personal data? Many of you will be requesting that bidders send their ID documents via email. This is not a valid method of transmitting valuable personal data. If there's one thing you take away today, it should be this. An email is as secure as a postcard traveling through the postal system. It may reach the intended recipient, but who knows how many others have read it along the way. You need to ensure that your personal data and, those of your, and that of your customers is secure in transit and at rest, and you have to document your controls accordingly. The storage limitation requirements now are quite onerous. AML requires you to have um, personal data stored for five years from the end of your business relationship or the completion of an occasional transaction. How are you going to securely store ID documents in hard or electronic copy for this time frame? Are you clear about whose data you even need to store? The final principle I'd like to draw your attention to is accountability, as you're responsible for complying with the UK GDPR and you must be able to demonstrate that compliance. If you haven't done so already, it's very likely you're going to need to register with the ICO and pay a data protection registration fee. How are you going to demonstrate that you have an appropriate level of security based on the risks this new AML processing is going to cause you and your business? Have you undertaken a data, impact, a data protection impact assessment for this new use of personal data, which could potentially place a very high risk on the individual's interests? So, next slide, please. Why is all of this important? Your identity is one of your most valuable assets. Just your name, address and date of birth provide enough information to create another you. And if your identity is stolen, you can find that uh, you may lose money or find it difficult to get loans, credit cards or a mortgage. These are all things that could affect your customers potentially if you have a data breach. An identity thief having obtained this information could then use it to open bank accounts, take out credit cards and could even apply for state benefits. When seeking to comply with AML, we're building repositories of our customers' valuable ID data, including passport copies and proof of address, and it'll only be a matter of time before somebody takes advantage. And when they do, you're going to be responsible as a data controller. So I'd like you to consider if you take an appropriate precautions. You wouldn't leave your diamonds out on the counter overnight expecting them to be safe. Cyber criminals exploit weaknesses. Storing personal data insecurely is an open invitation. Identity theft leads to identity fraud and the risks are growing. 
The National Fraud Database reveals cases of identity fraud are up nearly a third over the last five years alone. Next slide. And it's not the first time that the art market's been hit. Cyber criminals have already identified weaknesses and have come up with elaborate phishing scams and intervened with invoices in some very high profile galleries in Cork Street. Cyber attacks are growing and they're evolving every single day, particularly in light of the COVID pandemic. Almost half of UK businesses, 46% in fact, report having a cyber security breach or an attack within the last 12 months. <clears throat> Next slide. So is it worth the risk? The loss of their data could be the loss of your reputation. Data breaches can cost a, a business dearly. You could suffer from irreparable reputational damage, loss of revenue, potential litigation for non-material damage or even material damage, and fines from the ICO. You need to create a defensible position for your business. If you do nothing else, into your GDPR compliance, um, you must ensure that your AML procedure has gone through a data protection impact assessment and you have adequately assessed the risks that this new processing will bring to you. Thank you, Caroline. That is very sobering, dare I say, alarming information. And obviously the takeaway here is watch your reputation, um, be well prepared and have a refresh of your GDPR compliance. Um, and that comment about the security of emails I thought was particularly scary. So impact assessments are indeed very important. Um, Sarah, could we now, our final presentation, could we turn to you at Snoofer? Thank you, Pandora. So whilst important, the legislation is not particularly volume friendly, and this is the problem that Snoofer is solving. It was an easy decision to develop our own AML component, but it's taken actually months of research and development to get to where we are today. So I'm really delighted to have this opportunity to show it off. We have three levels of system, system checks, zero, one, and two. So zero indicates an unverified, and it's used really for guest users. So somebody might have submitted an online valuation, but they're not currently a vendor nor buyer. Level two would be for vendors or buyers falling short of the AML spend limit. Level two, vendors or buyers would be coming near at or above the AML spend limit. Let's look at this slide. So level one, we have email, telephone and address verification services and something also known as 3D secure. And for those who want it, an optional but unverified photographic ID. Next slide, please, Jerry. Thank you. Level two will include all of the level one checks and it but now incorporates the AML features. So we look towards verified photo ID, PEPs, sanctions, high risk countries and spend limit alerts. Next slide, please. Thank you. So here's a screenshot of our compliance dashboard, which sits in the main client detail account. At the top of the page, Quick glance tags indicate whether the client is level zero, one or two. And actually a nice feature is to upgrade the clients from one to two based on the spend limit alert, alert which tracks the AML qualifying items. So for example, if one invoice combined a piece of jewelry and a picture, only the picture total would be included in the spend limit calculations and the jewelry total excluded. Okay, on the right, spend levels alert the auction house if spending or purchasing gets within, say, 80% of circa £8,000, at which point you may wish to upgrade the client. It's our view it's easier to do this when there's incentives to take part in an auction and bid rather than ask retrospectively when there may be buyer's remorse. On the left, colour-coded, verified or unverified tags are used to indicate if checks have, have been passed successfully or not. And in this example, you can see that the country has returned an unverified flag. So it's important to emphasize that Snoofer does not undertake customer due diligence on your behalf, but rather we enable the technical checks for you to then make an informed decision. 
And for example, if a check returns a red flag, you can decide what action needs to be taken in the context of your risk assessment. So for example, do you need to go further and now apply the enhanced due diligence? Next slide, please. Thank you. So as this chart demonstrates, together SNUFA and FCS are able to offer clients a complete AML solution covering training, documentation, and the checks, which hopefully will remove all of that worry and all the burden from your shoulders. So thank you very much for listening. I'll pass back to Pandora for the Q&A. Thank you very much, Sarah. That was really informative and quite um, gratifying to see that we have such a lot of expertise here to help people in what is, as I've said, a very onerous um, procedure. Please, would you type any questions you have in the chat box? I don't see any yet, but I do have a couple of my own, so I will kick off with those. Um, Sarah, to come back to you, I was just going to ask, thinking about the linked transactions, over what period of time um, is the legislation applying here? Thank you, Pandora. It's our understanding that the legislation is unspecific. Um, so for this reason, having the spend limit alert and the policy and procedures you have in place should cover you. It would be nice in future, obviously, to get some guidance if HMRC or HMT, HM Treasury are thinking of a time frame in mind. Thank you. At Bandora, the other thing I'd say is that in, uh, when we look to this in the BAMP guidance, um, <clears throat> and it is always difficult to predict what a, a linked or an unlinked transaction is, but um, the focus was on the whether it's a single invoice um, or whether, uh, put it the other way, a what appears to be a single transaction has been broken up into different invoices in order to bring it below the threshold. So <clears throat> don't do that. That, would, uh, that wouldn't get you out of the regulation. Um, if it's a single invoice to a single client from a single transaction, then the chances are um, it would be seen as a single a single event which would or would not cross the threshold. So it's not really a question of time, it's a question of you know, the actual transaction. I think I understand anyway that if you do multiple transactions just below the threshold, that's going to um, send a lot of red flags out there. So um, that would be a bad idea anyway. It might do. It's a difficult area though, because an auction house you know, could be selling to a buyer and you never know when you're going to make the next sale. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that the, the, the bank guidance talks about a degree of, you know, is there an anticipated or expected relationship being set up? Uh, and that isn't set up just because somebody keeps reappearing, because um, you're not selling multiple goods that are the same. You're selling individual items. Um, you don't know whether somebody will come next month and buy another one. Um, yeah. So you wouldn't usually aggregate those two together for these purposes. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, Jerry, a question for you. If a client is purchasing through a company or trust, is it correct that I just have to identify the client themselves? How does the UBO, the ultimate beneficial owner, sit amongst all of these sorts of um, intermediaries? Um, whether you think you believe you know who the uh, beneficial owner is or the ultimate beneficial owner is, that, I'm afraid, is not uh, showing compliance with the regulations. You have to show... I guess the best way to describe it, your workings out, how you've actually got there. Um, so particularly, um, I mean, FCS compliance, we spend our half our lifetime immersed in the world of offshore and trusts and companies from a CDD perspective. You've got to actually obtain the correct documents. It uh, might be things like deed of trust, the shareholding register, or everything like that is going to allow you to actually drill down and find the ultimate beneficial owner. So you, you've actually, it's something that it's, it can be a very long-winded and time-consuming task, but it's something you have to do. You cannot just take on first value somebody walking into your auction house or gallery and saying, oh, I'm, I'm the beneficial owner and my company's going to buy this work of art. Yeah, fine, but you actually need to get the documentation or the audit trail that's going to allow you to actually clearly identify who the ultimate beneficial owner is, because time and time again, it doesn't matter what sector you are working in, be it the legal, the property sector, or even the art sector, people have been caught out quite badly because they don't actually know who the ultimate beneficial owner is. So, yeah, I'm afraid it is a long-winded process, but it's something you have to do. Is it legal to have a lawyer sitting in front of the beneficial owner um, conducting the transaction and not actually know who they are? No, it's, it's, not, it's not illegal. You can have a third party, an intermediary. You can have as many third parties and intermediaries as you so wish. 
be it lawyers, be it um, you know you or I, Joe Public, or another another amp, basically uh, representing the buyer. That, to a certain extent, you know, they'll be determined on the, the level of CDD you do in relation to that individual. There'll be an obligation in relation to that person. But either way, you cannot get beyond the, the you know the fact that sitting there will be somebody who will have paid the money to acquire this work of art, and it's that person you need to identify. Uh, and some of the big auction houses, particularly in the US, have been caught well short of where they need to be, and, and it's been a little bit embarrassing. So you have to identify the other beneficial owner. There's, uh, there's no way around it, I'm afraid. Okay, great, thank you. I have quite a lot of questions coming through now, which I'm gonna to have to scrutinize the screen. There is one here for Caroline. Uh, regarding GDPR, is it allowed to keep the client's passport photos on file, say on our mailing list and secure within our firewall, etc.? You're on mute. Yep, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> so the key consideration is that you need to ensure that the data is safe during transit and at rest. So it's a couple of questions I've seen come through. I would recommend a secure web form embedded into your site. Um, I would tend to go with a third party provider who has met the ISO 27001 27, standard because you really need to make sure that however you're storing that data, it's appropriate, it's within the EU or the UK, so you know where the data center is and you're notifying people accordingly. But certainly please don't store anything on your email servers at all <laughs> because it's an accident waiting to happen there's lots of third party providers for secure web forms it might be something you want to get your web developers involved in but actually ask what kind of protections are around it and and look for certification like i say iso 27001 is a gold standard go back to your provider ask them if they have that in place if they don't maybe you need to look elsewhere so I guess you do have to use email, but you have to just make sure that nothing is stored on the email and it's taken off and then used through the secure. No, I don't use email to send data like this. Use a secure web form. Mm -hmm. So it's a web form which would be embedded into your own website, but actually that data goes elsewhere. And then you can start looking at things like digital retention periods too. Um, one of the solutions that I implemented many years ago with one of my auction clients, we have a secure web form which we direct people to. They upload their ID documents. We have a folder for the sale, which is live with restricted access. And then we archive the folder. And then after a period of time, when we've finished with that data, it's um, moved into an archive where only the accountant has access and then eventually once the statutory retention period's up, it gets automatically deleted in a secure manner. So there's quite a lot you can do around this, um, but it is a big area of concern for me. Having worked with auctioneers for such a long time, I see this being your key vulnerability. You must get this bit right because the ICO will fine you for a data breach and your customers will walk if you lose their documents. Very, very good advice, thank you. Um, we had quite an easy question here for you all. Um, the cost of registration with HMRC, is it £300 per year? Is that the correct figure? 350 and it is every year, I'm afraid. And you have to do it every year? You must renew. Um, absolutely essential you renew because that's one of the things that people forget to do. Um, okay. So, yeah, once you register, you have to keep renewing every 12 months. Okay. And question is, are these regulations being applied evenly across OECD jurisdictions? A tricky uh, one. Probably well, not. No, but, no. but they're, they're based on the EU regulations, so, uh, or the directive. So um, they are only supposed to be applied in the EU, and that includes the UK post-Brexit. Brexit has no impact on that. Um, the Americans are... Um, working on something similar, but they're somewhere behind, and uh, ditto Hong Kong. But uh, no, there is no uh, OECD version that applies uh, to all our friends around the world. Okay, thank you. Very interesting. There's so many global transactions. And then yep. somebody else says we have, we only have perhaps between two and four transactions per year that go over the threshold. We auction somewhere between 1,300 and 2,000 lots a month. I believe we still have to register, but this would only apply to those artworks over the limit. This is difficult for quite a lot yeah. of us. You, you are still within scope. It doesn't matter whether it's one work of art or it's 100. You are within scope, I'm afraid, to save the money laundering regulations. 
and therefore what you have to put in place or the framework you have to put in place uh, will apply to you. Um, I'm afraid that's the way it's been set out. Um, it, it just, the you know, the nature, if you equate this to the property sector where you have one person maybe who might be acquiring one property or two properties a year, they are the same obligations as, as your high street property professional who is selling, you know, 300 properties a year or whatever. I'm afraid just having that one or two transactions per month brings you within scope within line of the money laundering regulations. Uh, but but I, would, I would just clarify that in terms of HMRC and what they're looking for for compliance, it will only be those transactions that they have a remit or supervisory responsibility for and that they will look to see compliance with, not the other 1,200 that, have, that have, uh, you've done under the threshold. And the challenge, of course, in an auction is you don't know what it's going to sell for. So mm. yeah. you, you may yeah. think something's worth 500, but somebody else may disagree. And if two people disagree, it could go for a lot more. Um, so you've got to be, you would have to be in a position to be able to produce um, the, the right processes if asked, you know, for something that then flies. Yeah. We still have sleepers in the auction world. So it's quite <laughs> um, and then um, could you elaborate on the CFT checks, which are part of the AML regulation? Who would like to take that one? I can go if you want. Uh, you're talking about counter terrorist financing. Um, you, you don't actually do a counter terrorist financing check as such. Uh, it, it should all be part of, you're into the CDD field. Basically, it's anti money laundering compliance and also counter terrorist financing. Uh, you have to bear that in mind. But actually, what you're, uh, you're undertaking the check is in the predominantly anti money laundering um, with, with, a, with an element of counter terrorist financing, but that's a whole different ball game in terms of red flags, potential red flags. Um, and, and what we've seen in recent times, particularly with the US market, hence the change in their legislation, uh, that's driving forward of things like antiquities that they're probably looking at with the, the countess terrorist financing. Uh, but yourselves here in the UK, primarily looking at anti-money laundering, but of course, yeah, counter terrorist financing is part of that. But they are, you know, the red flags will be different for both, et cetera, et cetera, I would suggest. Quite pertinent with the new Cultural Goods Act coming into Europe yep. as well at this point of time and um, uh, other areas of compliance we have to look at. Um, there's another question here that if your bidders are bidding through a third party bidding platform, this is an interesting one that is going to affect quite a few people. It's our understanding that the auction house must satisfy their own AML procedures and not rely on that on the third party checks or indeed other auction houses who may have approved a client for bidding. Is, is this correct? Basically, yes. I mean, as a AMP, you are responsible and therefore liable if there's a problem with not carrying out proper CDD. Um, so the bottom line is you've either got to do it yourself or there is a root called re reliance under the regulations that allows you in theory to rely upon a third party who is also themselves a registered uh, AMP. Although I have to say the terms of the reliance are incredibly restrictive in practice and because you continue to be responsible for what they've done I think uh, a lot of people have taken the view that um, it's just not safe or practical to rely on you know, another auction house say uh, and that you have to do it yourself. Uh, the regulations also say that even if you're relying on somebody, you still need to know the ID of the person who's being, who has allegedly been checked. Uh, and in practice, if you know the ID of the ultimate buyer, well, then you may as well do the checks yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, also going on from that, Tom, because the, 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 uh, the organizations like the bidding platforms, as an example, that you might be buying from, they are themselves are not regulated uh, entities. So therefore, you cannot place the reliance on what they've done. You're outsourcing effectively that. So that's yep. one of the things that you have to bear in mind. You could place reliance on another AMP, but not effectively on a third party bidding platform like that. Okay. Which, which does mean you, you, when you choose between the different platforms and for that matter, the different providers, you do need to know what they're doing because they're doing it on your behalf mm. and you're still on the hook. So you yeah. do need to know what they're doing and how they're doing it. Absolutely. If the buck stops with you, it's your responsibility. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Great. Thank you. Well, we have another question here. As a sole practitioner, valuer and consultant, I'm advised that I need to be registered as an AML for 
we put AMP, he says, registers as an AMP, which I have now done. As a result, I am my own reporting officer, but I'm somewhat overwhelmed by the documentation and establishing the policies. How can I get help with writing the protocols that I have to assemble? Well, I guess we have just- Speak to Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, that's what we do day in, day out. We, um, we write draft policies and procedures and we undertake risk assessments for firms in the regulated sector. Um, and that is what that is our bread and butter, shall we say. That's what we provide our clients day in, day out. They've been through copious amounts of HMRC uh, supervisory visits and always pass the flying colours, I'm pleased to say. Um, so, yep, that is what we do day in, day out. Great, fantastic. And then I had another question for Sarah. Does the training requirement only cover those involved with financial transactions in the organization? I think Jerry kind of asked that, but I don't know if you'd like to elaborate, Sarah, in light of what you do. I will defer to Jerry on that one, if that's okay. okay. Um, well, going back to what I said on the slide, it's frontline staff. Now, frontline staff are described as people who are involved in any sort of sales aspect, client facing, shall we say, with your business. Uh, and anybody that's in the back office, uh, don't use that word lightly, but in the back office, you know what I mean, involved with the financial aspect of your business. So might have an administrative role, but effectively is a financial, because the reason being they are potentially the third pair of eyes within your business uh, in terms of spotting red flags, if they're the ones sending the monies or, uh, overseas or watching <laughs> monies come in, et cetera. So that's why I would very much advise that they have some form of uh, proper AML training. And I think the, the BAMF guidance refers to relevant staff or mm -hmm. relevant people. So that's, I think, deliberately open-ended. So your client-facing staff, your uh, people looking after your finance side. But it could also be, as Jerry said, somebody else who's your, you know, your third pair of eyes. Anybody who deals with um, clients regularly and who might spot something that's out of the ordinary. So... I think at, at, at some level, you need to have really all your staff trained at some basic level. All your staff should know who your money laundering officer is and who to go and talk to if they have a question and what are the basic things they should be looking out for. Um, and that, if nothing else, is self-preservation from your point of view. I think this is a very good um, area to consider the balance between you know, what is an actual legal requirement what is ethical and what is best practice. And uh, the companies that aim for excellence in all of those three, I think are going to um, make sure that they avoid having some very nasty fines and bad damage to the reputation. Um, we have everybody just past the six o'clock one hour mark. So um, I, I don't I don't see any final questions. Um, shall I wrap this up? Would any of the panelists like to add a final comment? Or? Well, I, I wouldn't mind answering James's question that's coming on the chat board, if I may, because mm. I'm Welsh and he's, he's asking about farm machinery. So it's, it's dear to my heart. <laughs> um, yeah. James, you'd be pleased to know that at, moment, at the moment in time, doesn't matter how much uh, your tractor may sell for, it does not qualify. It's only... Um, uh, works of art as defined by by Tom Miller on so your farm machinery you can continue with you'd be pleased to know unless of course you are selling it for cash on a serious point because of course if you are selling anything over 10,000 euros for cash then it might well it would bring you into the realms of being a high value dealer as opposed to an art market participant but uh, farm machinery per se is uh, not included. Thank you Jerry. And um, these have all been such useful insights. And I think the Q&A has been equally as valuable as the presentations. And I think my one takeaway from this is that using the experts will save you an enormous amount of money, an enormous amount of hassle, time, and of course, you know, reputational damage as we've discussed. And all the contact points are here on the slide. So please take a note of them and get in touch with our experts. And I think, you know, we could have gone on a lot more. Maybe there's some room here for some other more specific training in the future or a white paper or something. But the message really is that you absolutely must get compliant now and take this directive very, very seriously because of the uh, potential consequences. So thank you very much to everybody, uh, to all our panellists, and we look forward to hopefully seeing you again sometime in the future with an update.
Thanks so much indeed. Try right. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Everyone. Thank you.